And I don't think any other non-overhead movement could replicate the growth that I've seen. Occasionally just going ape shit can be useful because sometimes I'll equal my PR and then I'll get one more rep and I'll be like, no, I want a double two rep PR. I want a three rep yeah. PR. I want a four rep PR. Odd on the lats. I think that the look of, of like wide flaring lats and Terry's is really, really cool. So I want to kick things off talking about triceps. You have said that tricep isolation work is an absolute must and that you consider overhead work to be non-negotiable for those looking to maximize the development of the long head. You've also talked about the horrifyingly messed up stuff that you do to grow your triceps. So what are intermediate lifters getting wrong with tricep training if their goal is to maximize their tricep development? Wow. Okay. Right off the start with something I think a lot of people will find uh, interesting because I would say that my triceps are overall my best muscle group, um, specifically the, the long head of the triceps, which is sort of that bottom part. When you're flexing your biceps and front double biceps, it's that part that sort of sweeps down and creates not that illusion of size, it, it's actual size. Um, but I think it is, is particularly important for aesthetics your side chest, for just looking big in clothes. It's, uh, it's an important muscle group. Uh, there have been various studies here. I personally found that overhead work was very, very important and very, very useful for growing this area. And I don't think any other non-overhead movement could replicate the growth that I've seen um, from them. Obviously, there's going to be a certain amount of individual variation and in response to the training. Um, I would say that my favorite is using a rope and then sort of facing away from the attachment. So you could set the attachment up high and then you sort of have to twist it around so that you're facing away. And then okay. you're, you're sort of, so you're facing almost down towards the ground and then you are extending outwards. And so this allows you to get the hips involved. Um, and so you can almost, if you hit the sticking point and you can't extend your elbows any further, you can yeah. kind of rock into the movement and ease through the sticking point and then control the eccentric and then rock through the sticking point. And so this allows you to, to go beyond failure. Now it's important not to cheat or to, to use that momentum before you hit failure. So make sure you're getting slowing, grindy reps where you really can't usually the sticking point will be somewhere in the middle. Um, and so make sure you're getting some slowing reps, some difficult reps, and then you can get a few beyond failure. Um, so I found that's a really useful variation. The rope is mostly just because it's more joint friendly and allows you a little bit more range of motion. I tend to keep the, uh, the ends of the attachment, the, uh, the balls, if you will, together. Some people say that you should separate them at the top but I find that that makes that part of the range of motion most challenging. So it becomes most challenging to separate them at the very contracted position. Okay. And thus you can't use nearly as much weight. And some people might say, oh, that's just ego lifting. Well, it means that you turn it into essentially a contraction focused movement. And I want it to be a more mid range focused movement okay. where your long head is, is already stretched because you're overhead and your, your sticking point is somewhere in that mid range. So it's almost like the incline dumbbell curl for the triceps where you're in this nice stretched out mm. position. Um, but it's a mid range focused movement. And then you can do another variation. And this is where I would actually recommend most people start. It's not my favorite, but I think it's, it's a, a better version to learn first where you have the attachment down a little bit, usually in the middle, and then you are just standing there vertically and you're extending upwards. So the first version, it's up high and then you're leaned away doing them that way. With this yeah. version, it's down a little bit and you're just standing there. And this that, doesn't allow very much idea. cheat. Yeah. yeah, so that that's a good variation. It keeps it strict. It teaches you to go to failure or, or very close to failure. You can't really go beyond failure because if you try to get the hips involved, you kind of mm. just end up like this this shitty jump and it doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah. And so um, 
it's a good variation, I would say, for beginners and intermediates. But once you're intermediate, I would say experimenting with a variation that allows a little bit more of a natural movement is probably a good idea. The reason I don't necessarily always recommend beginners start there is there's too much freedom. They can't handle that much freedom. And when they have that much freedom, they usually end up just like flailing around from the start. So first you have to learn how to go to failure with that strict form. And then maybe if you're ready, you can go to, to a more free variation. You can also use a V-bar. I've been using it a little bit more recently where it's a little bit more stable. So it's slightly less joint friendly, I found. With the rope, you can just move however you want. With the V-bar, you're sort of locked onto the bar. You can't sort of swivel your wrists, you're locked in there. And so it's almost like a hybrid between an extension, a pure extension, and almost like a press. Because a press, you are extending the elbows, but you're also extending the shoulder. In a pure extension, you're just extending the elbow and there's very little pressing with the shoulder. But a V-bar, it's almost like between where you can get a little bit of a pressing action that you couldn't with the rope. So you can go heavier, but you have to make sure that you don't get too much of a pressing action because then you're getting less long head because it's just, you know, like a, a close grip V-bar press. Um, and so there's sort of this, this middle ground where it's a little bit of a press, but it's still extension. And this is where, um, you know, keeping the ego in check a little bit and making sure that it's enough extension to be a lot of triceps is uh, probably the way to go. Okay. So I know we're talking about exercise selection. I feel like that's discussed a lot, like with all the tier lists and, and things of that nature. But I feel like when I watch you do tricep work, like you're working with a lot of weight. So I'd love to understand how you think about things like progression and rep ranges and programming, because I feel like that's probably like the meat and potatoes that isn't being discussed as much because everyone's talking about like, what's the optimal exercise. So I'd love to understand how you've kind of got into that point where you're, you know, doing the whole stack um, with triceps. Well, some, sometimes the whole stack is not as much because uh, some cable setups, they use the double pulley system. And so it's like half of what, what it says on the stack. And so you have to be really careful with some of these cable setups, these, these cable stations, because sometimes, and this happened to my old gym, where I thought I was doing like 70 kilo, 150 pound push downs. Uh, and I wasn't, it was just that, that's what I thought was on the stack, but it was a double pulley and, um, it was, you know, maybe half that I, it, but it's hard to tell. Sometimes they're mislabeled as well, or they'll be labeled in kilos, but they're actually pounds. And so it seems really light or something like that. And so, yeah, you do have to make sure you're only really comparing that cable station to that cable station. Cause if you change gyms, you might be be way off the mark. One thing you can also do is you can do your push downs at the pull down station. Sometimes that can work. And those are almost always labeled perfectly um, because it's just the weight. That is the weight. It's just usually a single uh, attachment, a single pulley. And so it's just one to one. And so that could be a good option. Sometimes it feels a little bit different, maybe a little bit smoother, which might throw some people off. Um, in terms of progression, I think when you're very advanced, things change a little bit. And now I am, I am genuinely advanced. And so, you know, I might put on, on a specific lift that I've been working on for a long time, I might gain one rep a month. I mean, one rep a month, that's six, that's six reps every six months. It's 12 reps a year that's actually pretty good going on some lifts. And so you're going to be repeating performance a lot of the time. If you're hitting the same lift twice in a week, which sometimes I do, you're going to see a lot of numbers that are repeating the exact same performance, or you will see your, your performance might go down. It might go up slightly. 
And so you kind of have to look more at the overall trend of what the numbers are doing rather than last session I did this, now I have to do this, next session I have to do this, um, because you might not always be hitting PRs. But if you're not hitting performance increases, at least occasionally, well, that simply means the training is not working. And so that means you have to change something. Well, what do you change? Do you change the rep range? Sometimes that can work. Maybe you've been doing 10 to 15 for a while and you decide, okay, well, I'm going to go a little bit heavier. I'm going to try to drive performance up that way. I'm going to try to get maybe a top set of five or six, get some post-activation potentiation. Sometimes that can drag up the other rep ranges. Or maybe I'll decide to just keep performance the same and add in a little bit more volume, volumize, get some increase in stimulus that way. And then maybe I'll take out that volume later and see a nice bump in performance or, or maybe not. Sometimes you do something, you think it'll work, you get excited about it and it, and it kind of just doesn't, you know, when you, when you're very advanced, your performance is usually pretty stable and you'll have, okay, if I hit this many reps, that's kind of average. That's typical. It's just my baseline plus one rep. That's a great day. Plus two reps would be a PR minus one rep would be like, eh, a little bit off. Minus two reps would be a disaster that, you know, I have to explain this somehow. Otherwise, something has gone very, very wrong. If I slept badly and I have minus two reps on a specific lift, well, there we go. But I get minus two reps and I don't know exactly why it is. That's not a good sign at all. And so I have to occasionally bad days happen, but they always happen for a reason. You have to explain why the bad day happened or why the good day happened. And you have to be very observant of these trends and of these um, of these observations because otherwise you're kind of just going in and you're not training. You're just lifting. You're just going in there and kind of doing what makes you feel good. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you want to get better, you have to take observation of if you are actually getting better or not. So whether it is increasing your volume, sometimes decreasing your volume, going based on feel can be a good indicator there. If you feel really beaten up, well, you know, maybe reducing the volume could be a good idea. Um, if you are not progressing and you feel fantastic, yeah, I think throwing in another few sets, especially if it's arms or something, yeah, I think that can be a very good strategy moving forward. Then you get into exercise variations of sometimes you do a lift and it doesn't really seem to be progressing and you don't really feel like you're getting anything out of it. Maybe you're going to get more out of something else, right? Maybe an exercise gets a little bit stale after several months and you just, you're not really feeling it. And, and I think it's okay to swap it out as long as you're not doing that all the time before a real plateau. I mean, if you repeat performance once, that could still be very useful work that is being done. In fact, maybe now you're into the actual real gains because your performance is increasing more slowly. And that means that it could actually just be real muscle growth, not the skill based aspect, not the neurological of, Oh, I'm getting better at this lift because I'm just new at this lift. So sometimes once performance plateaus, that's actually not a bad sign. It might actually be a sign of, oh, I'm in a slight plateau with maybe some increases. Well, when you're advanced, that's probably about as good as it gets, and that's a pretty good sign. And from a programming standpoint, do you think, you know, if you're an intermediate lifter who wants to grow their arms and triceps, A, should they have an arm day, and B, should they consider um, exercise order, potentially uh, putting those earlier in the session? So I'm a fan of an arm day. I've had two arm and shoulder sort of bro days for the past, oh man, the past three, four years, something like that. And my arms have grown considerably. I've put on about two inches on my arms since then, roughly. And so it's worked well for me. I, I really like that split. Day one is legs. Day two is sort of chest and back. And day three is arms and shoulders. And for me, legs take longer to recover from training than upper body does. And so I can't do upper, lower, upper, lower, upper, lower, because my lower is just tough to recover from three times a week. I probably could if I, if I 
manipulated some variables and reduced the volume or did different exercises that were maybe less stressful or kept a rep or two in the tank. But I like smashing legs. I like, I like smashing legs. I don't want to go into my leg session and be like, you know, I guess I should probably keep some reps in reserve so I can train again in two days. I don't really like that. And so I prefer training them once every three to four days, roughly. Sometimes I throw on a rest day as well. Um, and so this split works really well for me. I've trained a lot of people who respond very well to an arm day. It is very easy to recover from systemically. It is not very taxing. You feel like you trained after an arm and shoulder day, but you're not beaten up. You're not really tired. You just feel good. You just feel you just feel pumped, man. You just feel good, right? You feel you feel like you you did something, but it didn't wipe you out in the same way that you know doing heavy squats or deadlifts might. And so, yeah, I would say most people should try it out, but it's certainly not necessary for most people to gain size. Um, you know, if you're on a push pull leg split, you can still you can still make gains for your arms. You just might have to. Um, add in some direct work. I still wouldn't do them before compounds mm -hmm. um, because now you're limiting yourself for your chest and your back in a lot of cases. What you could do is put your triceps on a pull day and your biceps on a push day so that you're not limiting yourself. Because if you hit biceps hard before back, I mean, your forearms are gonna be shot, your biceps are gonna be shot, and you're just, most likely going to be impacting your performance. The exception might be if you do a lot of so-called optimal movements, which I actually have been doing, um, because specifically they do take the arms out of it. So if you're doing some kind of like arcing pullover where you're not pulling actively with the arm and you're sort of arcing down, you're working a hell of a lot of lat, mm. but you're not really working the biceps but you're also not really working the long head of the triceps like you might with a dumbbell pullover because there is some arm bend, right? So there's this sort of sweet spot of not too much arm bend where you're getting biceps, not too little arm bend where you're getting that long head of the triceps. It's just in the middle where it's a lot of back. Same thing with a lot of rows. You'll see some people where, they're, you know, they're, maybe they're doing their pull-ups like this. They're all scrunched up and they're sort of pulling towards the face and they're not really opening up their back and contracting the lats and the traps and everything like that. They're, they're clearly pulling with their arms. And that's how I kind of used to do pull-ups. And my strongest pull-ups were always when I was pulling with like upper traps and arms. It was like a sort of a weird hammer curl using my body weight as resistance and the, the last kind of helping out a little bit. Interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I think if you, if you change your technique where your chest and your back work is not targeting your arms as much, you can maybe hit arms before that, Okay. but I would still probably hit them after just because they're smaller movements. They're not as taxing. And as long as you can mentally put the effort in, I think you'll still get pretty good gains. The issue is that you have to have a lot of, of mental capacity and, and mental focus in order to, oh, I just hit 10 sets of back and 10 sets of chest. Now I have to hit arms. I could never do that. So I just shifted them back a day because I was not going to be training legs again anyway. So I wanted to have them on a separate day. Um, so I think either way can work. It's just that you have to have the same mentality. If you're totally fresh, great. If you're not totally fresh, not great, but you can still make it work in a lot of cases. And, and then on the opposite of that side, the same thing for chest. So if you see a lot of people bench press, yeah, they use a lot of arms, especially if it's a closer grip. Whereas other people, they sort of, they open up more and they get more torso musculature involved. And if your chest day is, is you know, maybe dumbbell bench press, where it's going to be less arms anyway, because again, you're moving in that arc. You're moving in that arc where it's going to be less triceps than if you're latched onto a barbell. And then maybe you do a couple of chest isolations. Dumbbell fly is not really going to be working your arms. A pack deck, a cable crossover, cable fly, that kind of stuff. 
those are all still going to be very effective for your chest, but they're not going to be working your triceps or your biceps very much at all. And so it really does depend on the plan. And I think a lot of ways of setting it up can work. You just have to make sure that you are still progressing and that you have that mentality of, I want to get better at performance at the lifts that matter. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think the mental side of thing is where people struggle, especially if they're doing like 25 sets in a workout and then it's like, okay, the last five is your arms. Okay, are you mentally focused on it, right? Are you checked out? And then I know you talk about things like effort being a skill. I also feel like effort is almost a skill depending on the exercise. So I feel like with, um, with shoulders, like lateral raises, my ability to have really good effort and go past failure is better than my capability of doing that with triceps. So I don't know if you feel there's anything there where it might be movement pattern or exercise specific, or is it just straight mentality? Well, I think, yeah, getting, that's part of the neurological aspect of it, I think, where once you do a lift, you have a certain result in terms of performance, then you want to beat it. Then you want to beat it. Then you want to beat it. And so when you start a new lift, you don't really know what weights to use. You certainly don't know how many reps you're going to get. I mean, when I see a trainer in the gym counting down the reps for someone, I'm thinking like, how do you know how many reps they're going to get? Like, they don't know how many reps they're going to get. How do you know? Well, you're you're all from the almighty. You're going to just know how many reps they're going to get. Yeah, sure. I mean, three more, two more, one more. Maybe they get six more. You have no idea. And so when it's a new lift, you don't have a very good idea of how many reps you're going to get. I also do find that some exercises, they just hurt more. I mean, leg extensions, very few people. And again, I'm a coach, so I see like lots of sets from various people and I see some movements are consistently harder to take to failure. Very few people take leg extensions, especially for like moderate to high reps, genuinely to failure. Usually it's like, all right, the rep speed, the rep speed is good. It's good. It's good. Oh, oh, they stopped. And of course it, it burned. So some exercises, they have that that constant tension, that that waste product buildup, and they just hurt. I mean, calves, notorious for being very, very uncomfortable to train. Same thing with leg extensions and some other movements. Whereas, you know, if you're doing a five rep max on a barbell bench press, you don't really get the same sensation. So I would say higher reps according to literature, are actually more important to take to failure, but they're also harder to take to failure because the sensation is uh, just a lot more exquisite. There's just a lot more discomfort there. And so I would say Bulgarian split squats as well. It's very very rare to see someone actually grind out a Bulgarian split squat. Same thing with push-ups. Very rare to see someone do a set of push-ups and they're actually like, you know, grinding out. I think it's because the, the core stabilizers, like you, you feel like you're not quite. And so you just sort of give up because there's always that option to give up. Whereas some other movements, they don't really have that option. I mean, if you if you don't have a spotter on a barbell squat or, um, you know, a barbell bench press, you're going to try. Because the outcome of not trying is, oh, now the bar lands on the pins or the bar is now on my chest and I have to like wiggle the plates off of it or something. And so there's no real downside of stopping the set of leg extensions. Like you just you just stop and then the pain ends and then you get out of the machine and it's gone in a few seconds. Um, whereas other movements they provoke that fighting instinct, I think, more than others. And so, yeah, I think every exercise is a little bit different. And I also think that on the movements that are harder to take to failure, failure is probably even more important because it's important on all movements. And if it's harder to do, it has to be emphasized. 
I think the push-up thing is pretty accurate. So I do like a deficit um, push-ups with parallettes uh, with weight. And I notice that I can progress every week. And then there's a part of me that's like, am I progressing or am I just giving a little bit more mental effort because yeah. I'm trying to beat the logbook? And it's just that type of exercise where, you know, you're not really failing. Like maybe I'm at the bottom and I'm failing, but maybe I could, you know, kind of get myself up and push one or two if I really wanted to with yeah. slightly questionable form. But I'm down there at the bottom and I'm like, oh, I'm stuck. And, yeah. I, beat, and I beat last week by one. So that must be it. Right. So I agree. Right. You that. have you have this number in your head and yeah. it's almost like if you have a to do list and you do everything on the to do list and then you remember you have something else to do and you do it. And then you write it on your to do list and you cross it off. <laughs> so you have that satisfaction of like, ah, oh, I did something. It wasn't actually the doing of the thing. It was the the anticipation, right? It was it was the dopamine. It was the oh yeah, ah, one more thing that I did. And, and so I think progression is sometimes the same way, where a lot of people won't fail a set at nine reps because it's an ugly number. You want to get ten. You yeah. want to get ten. That's such a beautiful number, right? The metric system. And even if you're American, you appreciate a good ten. Right? Who doesn't appreciate a good ten? And so you're not going to stop at nine reps. Like that's just ugh, that's it's disgusting, great. despicable. And so yeah, you get your ten, but eleven reps, you know, you just got ten. So I think we're good there. And so you have this expectation, and then you do it, and then your energy is gone, it, and and you're just done. You know, again at the bottom of the push up, you probably could get another one, but it's like. It's comfortable down there. You're at the bottom. You could just lie down and take your hands off. And, and so I think that's kind of just human nature where you did what you thought was required of yourself to do. And then you're kind of like, oh, I did the thing. Um, Check it so, out. I did the thing. Yeah, I think sometimes occasionally just going ape shit can be useful because it sets the bar. I mean, if I... And I, I've caught myself doing this because sometimes I'll equal my PR and then I'll get one more rep and I'll be like, no, I want a double two rep PR. I want a three rep yeah. PR. I want a four rep PR. And especially if it's a new movement that you've never done before. I mean, you might get six reps the first time you do it. And then the next time you get 15 or something insane like that, because you just, maybe you're a little bit fresher. You're just more in tune with the movement. And so sometimes throwing your expectations out and just going and going and going and going can be the way to go because then you set a new baseline and that is your new expectation. Um, and then you can leapfrog off of that next time. Yeah. It's really interesting because I've had times where I've put the wrong amount of weight on the bar. So I put 10 more pounds than I thought was on the bar and I got the amount of reps that I was going to get with the lower weight. And then yeah. I'm like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Because it was just like, I thought I was going to get it. I pushed for it. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. Anyways, interesting mental exercise there. So I want to move directions here. I'm going to throw it up, throw out a couple of topics. And you can tell me if you think it's overrated, underrated, or fairly rated. Uh, mm. The first one is work capacity. I would say underrated just because, yeah, I... I I coach a lot of people and and a lot of people they think cardio is is killing your gains and I think you actually have to almost balance your work capacity and your recovery capacity. If you if you are at the limit of what you can recover from anyway, you don't really need more work capacity. Um because doing more work doesn't actually help you if you can't recover from it. And I've been in the situation where I could do a lot of work, but I just couldn't recover from it. So at the end of my cut last year, I could do set after set after set because I was doing a lot of cardio. I was lean. I was lighter. I was down to like 190 pounds. And I, I could do a ton of work, but I just couldn't recover from it. So I'd smash a session in the gym, feel really good about it, and then come back the next session and be weaker. And I think, what? Like, how, how could that be? It's just that I was dieting and I was, you know, I was dieting really hard and I was lean. 
and my calories were low and my step count was high and I just couldn't recover from it. So make sure that you're still focusing on recovery and, and having a, a reasonable training program and, and not overdoing your, your volume uh, as I have done in the past. But I would say for the average person, yeah, work capacity, it's important and it's worth focusing on. I mean, most people, they don't do high rep squats or even moderate rep squats because they want to do these other movements. But I think often this is them just shying away from stuff that is difficult. High rep walking lunges. I mean, I, I tend to do Romanian deadlifts in the 10 to 15 rep range. And some people think that's crazy. And I, I think that if you are getting out of breath, from doing, you know, moderate reps for, for lower body, that's usually a sign that you're in bad shape. Um, but if you if you feel like you can perform the work with reasonable rest periods and you're not getting gassed out, then I think work capacity is probably fine. But it is also one of those things that if you don't keep it up, it doesn't have an automatic upkeep. And so yeah. sometimes you might find that in your 20s, you're fine because maybe you did sports in college or something. And then into your 30s, maybe it could be an issue. And so it's one of those things where a little bit goes a long way. You don't have to devote a ton of time to it. I, mean, I usually do like 10 to 15 minutes of cardio twice a week, but it's pretty hard. That's the thing. If, if you want to actually have cardio that translates over to lifting, you can't just go for a walk. I mean, if, you, if someone's idea of cardio is going for a walk, uh, that's not going to help very much. It might help your recovery, but it's not going to help your ability to put in the work. Yeah, for sure. I play uh, tennis and squash like twice a week, and that's my kind of high intensity cardio. That'll if I'm chasing a ball and playing with a friend, I can go really hard. So that's kind of how it works. So it's like, okay, yeah, those are I'm competitive, so I can. And I want to beat my friend. So it's like, oh, 40 minutes went by. I'm exhausted and we're good. All right. Next yeah, one. you can make it fun. That's the way to yeah. go. Yeah. You just need a ball and then you can chase it and then it's yeah. fun all of a sudden. All right. Next one here is uh, stress management. I would say probably underrated for most people. Um, I think it's one of those things where I don't get particularly stressed out. I just, I'm just, I've always just been very chill, even if I have a lot of work to do, even if I am in a situation where I could easily be stressed out. I think in a lot of ways, it's a choice. And some people don't like to hear that. And I know everyone is in a very different situation, but it's just how you respond to it. I mean, if you're in a stressful situation, it's, it's how you respond to it more than anything. And so finding ways to frame things, keep things in perspective, and then bring yourself down, or just not bring yourself up in the first place, uh, I think are very, very valuable. If you're constantly in a fight or flight state, it's not that you can't make progress, but it definitely will impact things. And it's just as important as diet, your training, your diet, your sleep, and then your stress management. And it's, it's up there. It's on that Mount Rushmore, uh, as you say, of <laughs> big things that matter. And if you have three of the four, you're probably fine. But four of the four is always going to be better. And your stress can impact your sleep. Your stress can impact your, your diet and your, your hunger. It can impact your response to training, can it impact your performance. So, yeah, I think it's worth focusing on for most people, especially if you have, you know, if someone has kids, if they have a really busy job, if they have a lot of stuff going on in their life, finding ways to not always get super up in their own head and kind of chill out a little bit, especially in the evening, I think is, uh, is a good idea for sure. I like how you gave yourself uh, your own Mount Rushmore question there. That was pretty <laughs> hilarious. And uh, I'm someone who I think similar to yourself. I'm I'm pretty 
chill. I don't get stressed out, but I have lots of reasons to be stressed out. Like I'm working on a startup. I'm interviewing you today, but like I turn, I almost turn that stress into excitement. If that makes sense. Like it's the oh, day yeah. before I'm interviewing and I'm like, I haven't done as much research as I want. Like someone might be super stressed about it and I just get my headphones on and I'm like, all right, like, like let's lock in, let's do this. And I get excited about it. But I also have a ton of downtime activities. I watch stupid TV shows. I scroll around on YouTube. I used to play like mobile games. I hang out with my friends and play board games. Like having those downtime activities and trying to not always be perfect will actually help you progress in the gym. 100%. And I see people, because that's one of my questions on, on the questionnaire, what is your self-rated life stress on a 1 through 10 scale where 10 is the most stressed out? And I see people where I'm reading through their lifestyle and all their information and, and their job and their schedule and everything, and I'm like, holy crap, this guy's got to be at least an 8 or a 9 or a 10 out of 10. Like, he, there is a lot going on. He's like, I have a two, maybe a high one. <laughs> like, what? How is that? And they're just like, I don't know. They find ways to relax, as you said, or they just don't. Because I, I do think that the self-assessment is the most important thing. It's how you view your stress. It's how you view how things are going. And other people, you know, they're living at home with their parents and they're like, yep, I'm on summer vacation. And then they're like, yeah, maybe maybe a seven or an eight or a nine out of 10. I'm like, well, what? How? And I, I kind of almost want to ask, like, what else is going on? And sometimes there are other issues or I mean, trauma or, or sure. stuff that sometimes I, I maybe don't even I'm not even qualified to ask about or deal with. Um, so, again, everyone is in their own unique individual situation. Um, but I think I, it's not just sort of what, where your life is, it's how you respond to it. I think it's a lot of your self-talk. Like, what are you saying to yourself? Like I'll meet people and they'll just tell me how busy they are. And then I just imagine that that's what their self-talk is like. And if all I told myself is that I'm super busy and I'm the busiest person, I'd probably be stressed out too, but I'm more like, I'm doing fun stuff that I like and life is good, you know? And I know everyone has different situations and I'm, you know, I'm grateful for the situation I'm in, but I've, it's always been that way. Like it's, that's not new. That was like, since my twenties, like I was not stressed out about things and I still had ambitious goals, et cetera. So, all right. Yeah, there, there, I think there's probably a difference in terms of the hormonal response whether it's like more a cortisol response or more of like an adrenaline endorphin kind of response to uh, maybe to the exact same situation. Um, but it's just how you wrap your head around it. For sure. So something I respect about you is your ability to do the right thing, whether it be delaying gratification or following your curiosity. This has been clear since the days of answering questions on Quora you even provided your ebook for free with the only way you could receive payment was through red envelopes known as hongbaos that people would donate to you on WeChat. You've also mentioned the industry has become extremely monetarily focused to the point where it makes you sick. Can you talk about your approach and why it may differ to others that go to the dark side? Uh, um, I, I don't know. I've always had sort of the mentality of wanting to give at least as much as I get if if not way way more I mean if I'm not giving like 10 times as much value as as whatever else I'm charging um you know it's just it just doesn't quite feel right and when I was getting into the fitness industry I kind of had like imposter syndrome where it's like, well, who am I? What am I doing? This it doesn't, doesn't feel right. Like, and so, yeah, I would, I would give it away for free and I would kind of go to people's gyms to train them for free. And they would kind of sneak me into their gyms and I would train them except it had to be obvious that I wasn't training them because there were trainers who worked there. And so I'd say, Oh yeah, I've just moved into the area. I'll just, you know, oh, yeah, I'm just checking out the gym, you know, and then I would train someone uh, just like a friend or something for free. And then, you know, one day someone, a friend of mine was like, this was super useful, super helpful. I would feel bad if I don't pay you. <laughs> and so I was like, oh yeah, uh, 
I hadn't really thought about that side of things, like getting paid for this. Uh, sure. And, you know, since then, you know, there, there will be people in life who you meet who will always just take, 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 take from you. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, that's okay. Especially if you like to give, but you also have to be careful that it doesn't, you know, end up exploiting you. Like where someone DMs you every day on Instagram asking you various questions and they're not getting coached by you. And eventually it's like, hey, well, you know, this this doesn't feel as good because it's it's you know, the vibe is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I, I always just just enjoyed helping people and you know, eventually figured, hey, maybe I could make a career out of this. Um I would say I'm also not particularly materialistic. Uh, I also live in China where the cost of living is not particularly high. And so, yeah, if I was super greedy and I lived in a place where cost of living was very high and I wanted to buy $15,000 bike pedals for my bike or something, yeah, I mean, I would have to do things very differently in terms of the marketing, in terms of the prices, in terms of the messaging, in terms of, you know, getting sponsored by various supplement companies and whatnot. And, but I, I just don't, I don't really have expensive tastes. Um, I just, I don't really spend a lot of money um, on anything. I know some people do, and that's fine uh, as long as they make money the right way. But, but I don't really have like a, a very high bar in terms of how much money I need to make. So partly because it's just the right thing to do, in my opinion, but also partly just because I don't really feel the need to make tons and tons and tons and stacks of cash. Um, and I have done very well. I, I've done, I've done better than I thought I would. And I, I'd like to say, you know, I, I appreciate everyone who's gotten the books and who has been a client and, and um, has supported my work. Um, but the money was, was never the most important thing. So I don't think it's, I think you're almost discrediting yourself by saying it's because you're not materialistic because I'm someone who is probably more materialistic than you. I have houses, I have cars, I have et cetera. But I think what I realized earlier in life, and you might resonate with this kind of being an economics major is like how compound interest works. Sure. And my experience is that goodwill compounds at an incredible rate. So just doing the right thing for me, it's been like, we made our last software like free for teachers and admins and it went crazy. And it wasn't like this big, like conversion funnel strategy. It was strictly like, this is the right thing to do. And then those people talk to other people and then those people talk to other people. And then those people talk to Google and really yeah. awesome things happen. So I actually feel doing the right thing can be the right long-term business approach as well. In the long term, though, that's the thing. Because everyone, it, it, it's harder to monetize fitness content. And I see some people where I know what they're going through because maybe their back is up against the wall. And I've been in that situation where you don't have a ton of money and everyone needs money to live and survive. And you're flying pretty close to those trees. Mm -hmm. And so you have to sort of do what you have to do to make ends meet. Uh, and I, I get that. I understand that. But but yeah, long term, treating your audience well and, and providing as much information for free, um, I think, is the way to go. It's just that sometimes it, it takes a long time for that to uh, to, quote unquote, pay off. And if it never does, you know, I'm OK with that as well. Um, I think a lot of people, they, they think that they only have a few years on social media. They only have like a year or two of their time in the sun. And I think sometimes that is true because you see you're, you're a student of YouTube fitness. You see all these guys who pop off for a year or two and then the algorithm kind of dumps them. And then there's the next guy who this is it's their time. And then the algorithm dumps them. And so I think sometimes people think that, oh, now I'm getting tons of views. I need to actively monetize that to make my millions in this short period of time. But yeah, sometimes taking a longer term view might actually be the way to go. Um, just because it, it does, 
I don't know if I believe in karma, but yeah, goodwill is certainly a real thing. And um, actually, there there was one content creator who uh, made a negative video about me, and then he DM'd me later saying like, "Man, your fans are crazy. They are they are hardcore. Like they <laughs> they really get after it." I'm like, "Yep, <laughs> yep. <Yeah>. They uh, <laughs> they are enthusiastic for sure." Yeah, because, you know, there's this quote, I think it's a Warren Buffett quote, and it's always stuck with me. It's like, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And if you think about that, you'll do things differently. And for me, that's always been the mentality. It's like, why would I want to ruin the momentum and the character that I've built over decades over something quick? And I, I understand what you're saying. Some people's backs are against the wall. So I might just be in a position where I don't have to do that, but I would just never do that. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of pisses me off in that sometimes that's not true. Like you'll see some fitness influencers screw over their audience and then their audience will forgive them. Even if it was something that was just a blatant scam, something that like this person is clearly screwing you over. They don't respect you. And sometimes their audience is like, yeah, but he says the funny things or whatever. And to me, yeah, that, that's always kind of pissed me off. But their um, reputation is ruined to the people who know. Right. Their yeah. peers, their reputation yeah. is ruined. They'll still have customers. They'll still stay, still make money. They can be the used uh, car salesman or whatever. But if you know, you know, right? Yeah. And I think that's what's important. They've lost the respect of their peers because they understand what's happening but it can still yeah. piss you off that they're still you know selling their shitty products or whatever it might be i also i'm going to pull this image up here this is icky guy uh, you actually oh, yeah. did a uh a video on this regarding body fat and i think this is what's really interesting here is some of these people may be perfectly here on the icky guy side and then because they want to get paid more money here at the bottom, they stop doing what they love and they mm -hmm. forget about the mission and what the world needs. And they're going to realize something's missing, but they're not going to be able to put together what it is. And it's because they've sacrificed some of their values and what their audience needs in order for more money. And you got to kind of find that sweet spot for you. Yeah, no, that's a good example. And I think you can drift around a little bit, but if you drift too far in any one of those directions, something is going to feel a little bit off for sure. Yeah. I've even had it where I've done the, what I'm good at, what the world needs and what I can be paid for. But because it's not what I love, it's still miserable. Like I've done trade shows and I'm like, why am I traveling? Like, yeah. I don't really care about this deeply, even though I know it's a good thing. Like I've, help kids get safer on the internet i care yeah. about that but i don't like truly care about that enough that i want to like invest my life towards it yeah and you can i mean i i know people who have worked jobs like that for a few years and you could easily say that oh if they pay enough maybe they'll offset to where you could then do what you love later and i think there's sort of a rationale for that to a certain extent but if it's too long, life is just too short to spend an excessive amount of time in that area for sure. Cool. All right. So kind of a funny question, you know, we're talking about the, the time when you were kind of struggling and, uh, you know, doing workouts for free and helping people out. So what was the better gig sports modeling or your acting career? Uh, hoo -hoo -hoo. Probably. Oh man, both of them sucked. Both of them suck for, for different reasons. Um, I didn't do a ton of the sports modeling thing. Um, I think that was probably the worst one uh, just because, you know, there was this fitness product. Someone actually sent it to me a, a year or so ago. It was like this sort of ab wheel roller. And, you know, they make you take a whole bunch of pictures and videos and stuff. And then, like, you have to... Uh, I think they wanted me to do like a voice recording after it, but you know, they'll say, Oh, go to the very bottom position and then just hold it and just, just hold it. And that's actually pretty difficult for an ab wheel roller. Um, 
so that wasn't fun. But again, you know, my back was up against the wall. And, you know, sometimes there's some quick part time thing you can do. And um, if they had if they had approached me now, I'd be like, nah, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Um, but but in 2000 and whenever it was, you know, yeah, I jumped at that. Um, and then acting that similar situation, just sort of like touch and go. I didn't have any lines. I just sort of had to stand there and look tough. Um, so that was actually pretty easy. That, that was actually a lot more fun because it was with some friends that I uh, actually played Dungeons and Dragons with back nice. in, I think, 2018, 2019. Um, and that was actually a blast. Like, I, they, I think I had tattoos and, you know, fake tattoos, obviously. Um, and I just had to stand there and look tough as the real actors sort of did their thing. And so, yeah, actually, that was probably the uh, the most fun I've had <laughs> doing a job at that time. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I've, I've had other not so fun jobs as well, like um, where you have to stand on a bridge and pass out flyers to people. And you don't, and after a while, you don't even really care if someone says yes or no. You just care about how they treat you, right? If they say yes, they take the flyer, but they look at you like, piece of garbage it's like ah like i uh, that's not that's not a good feeling but if they politely refuse you or you know they they say something nice or something you know but they say no like no thanks to the flyer like yeah that, that's all right so it's one of those things where i'm not a particularly good salesperson um and so that was pretty miserable but at least getting used to rejection is uh I think everyone should have a sales job where they get rejected a lot for at least a month or so when they're uh, a younger. That was my, that was my first guy. job. I was making a hundred phone calls a day and getting rejected and right. just getting beat up. And it, it helped in my like real life where I was like, not scared to like, you know, talk to women or my friends or ask things. Cause I'm like, whatever, like you just get yeah. such thick skin from it when before I was, you know, scared to say anything. Yeah, especially a lot of guys, they're just sort of at home alone in their own little bubble. I mean, sending them out into the world in order to get, you know, their ass kicked a little bit verbally, yeah. or at least, you know, experience a little bit of of social rejection or negativity. I think for a lot of guys, that's uh, kind of exactly what they need, even if it doesn't quite feel good. Cool. And I'll send you my uh, D and D character sheet for my divination wizard, so you can check nice. out on it later. Uh, all right, I'm going to throw out some quotes here. Tell me first thing that comes to mind. Uh, some guys they are essentially talking shit about what gave them the best gains they ever had, and to me that seems strange and backwards. Yeah, so I actually have a video coming up on pretty much exactly that. I call it lifting amnesia, where someone did something to get their either beginner or intermediate gains, which are most of the gains you're going to gain. And then they kind of like do something else, which is maybe more appropriate when they're advanced. And then they suddenly turn on what they used to do. And it's, it's always been a wild thing to observe because it's this just cognitive dissonance where they're, they're talking shit about something they used to do that got them a ton of gains. And then uh, it's probably exactly what their audience should do in a lot of cases. Um, but somehow now it's like the worst thing in the world or it's D tier or, oh, it's not stable enough or, oh, it's too heavy or causes too much fatigue or any one of a dozen things that could be bad about an exercise. Like the strength curve is not perfect. Okay, well, it can still be really good for muscle growth. And so... Yeah, I realized that a lot of fitness content creators, they're advanced. Um, and so they might be doing advanced, very specific training that is beneficial to them. But if you're a beginner, especially, you probably want to do more general training, greater emphasis on the compounds, greater emphasis on so-called basic movements, barbells, dumbbells, that kind of thing. And then a little bit of machines, a little bit of cables, a little bit of isolation, whereas a lot of advanced lifters, everything is tailor-made to them because they're advanced. 
And so they might not do any of the basics. It's, it's very rare to see an extremely advanced natural bodybuilder do a barbell bench press. Like I followed the training of a lot of top natural lifters. Very few of them do yeah. barbell bench press. It's just, you don't see it very often. Some of them do barbell squats, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them, it's just, it's just leg presses, it's pendulums, it's oh, hack yeah. squats. RDLs are still pretty popular, but many of them don't deadlift from the floor. Um, yep. Either sumo or conventional. Sumo is better because it's less fatiguing, but it's also less range of motion. And so I've been doing sumo pulls recently, but if you're very strong and you're like a 700 pound sumo puller and you're interested in hypertrophy, it's really hard to justify doing anything in that stance just because it takes a lot out of you. It's a big investment and you could just spend that training money on something else. And so, yeah, if you're a beginner, just realize that you're probably not in the same boat as most of the people you're watching online. Yeah. And I think if you're a creator, you really need to be aware of that amnesia. So this isn't just fitness. This is all educators. Cause I hear a lot of successful business people and they'll say things like the most important thing you can do is to get in shape. And they'll say things like that. When all I know is when I was most successful business wise, I didn't give a shit about my health. I ate dominoes. I just worked all day. I grinded. It's not sexy. No one wants to hear that, that you give it all so you can make your business succeed. And that's what it is. There's, there was no cold plunges. There was like none of that shit. You know what I mean? I was just doing my thing all day. And then I would veg out on the couch and play ca- Clash of Clans and sleep and then repeat. But that doesn't sound as good as, as a man, you need to get in shape first if you want to be successful business so you can have a presence in a room. Like, that's not a thing. So you didn't have like a four hour morning routine before you started working? I didn't have any routine. I, didn't yeah, wake up. Start I woke up and started, and then I did it as long as I could, and then I took breaks when I was burnt out. Yeah. And that was it. And then I vegged out and watched TV and slept. Like it wasn't sexy. It wasn't motivational. It's just that's what it was. Yeah. All right. Next one here. All great lifters are students of the sport. They're students of the iron game. The best lifters are always learning, not just from their own mistakes, but from the mistakes and success of other people. Yeah, I agree. Um, <laughs> that guy knew what he was talking about. <laughs> I, I, I would say oh, he, he was on point. Um, I, I would say maybe not all, but most. Because occasionally you'll see a guy who is just raw talent, who's That's just him. like a Ronnie Coleman type, who's just very, very gifted. And they don't know the history of, of bodybuilding culture. They don't know the nuances. They don't know the training plans of various lifters. They kind of just went by feel the whole way. And they, they stumbled across things that worked really well for them. But that level of being gifted is just so, so rare. So, so rare. I mean, that's some one in a million type of stuff, right? Yeah. And if Um, you're that talented, you might also be like the master of the art of placebo too, because you're just so talented and everything's just always worked for you and it just keeps working. Exactly. I mean, and so these kind of people where, and that's actually a lot of fitness influencers. Obviously there's a lot of, of drugs often involved, but some of these guys just have prime beef grade genetics where they they literally do almost anything and they have just the great structure. They respond well to any movement, any rep range, any training split. Most of them still have to work hard and push themselves. But I've seen a few guys who they didn't really even seem to work that hard and they were still really freaking jacked naturally. And so, yeah, you, I mean, that's not even one in a hundred. That's not even one in a thousand. That's, that's very, very rare to see guys who don't even really have to think about things whatsoever and they still get better results than me in, in, in these cases. And, um, in the best case scenario, they stay humble and they, they know their genetics and they know how good they have it. But in the worst case scenarios, they talk a whole bunch of bullshit because they don't really understand how gifted they are and they attribute their training to their success 
when often they could have done almost anything. Um, and I've been accused of having these levels of, of genetics, accused like it's a bad thing, but um, I think people should realize that there are levels to this. And certainly I have above average genetics. I've never said I have average genetics, um, but there are some people who are just next level where right. they, I mean, they, they touch a weight and they blow up, like they stay lean year round, eating whatever they want. They don't have to focus on diet at all. Sometimes they have a crappy lifestyle. They go out partying. Um, you know, I saw, I actually saw a documentary and there was this homeless guy and he was like struggling to, to, you know, he was going to soup kitchens and stuff, fucking shredded, shredded with a good amount of muscle too. He didn't even go to the gym. He didn't lift. He didn't do anything. He's living in like this tiny little hut by the side of the road. And I'm sitting thinking they're like, man, if you got this guy some food and got him in a gym, he would be just an absolute monster. His physique without lifting and being homeless would have gotten Natty or Nots on Natty or Juice Reddit. Like that's how good his physique was without even lifting. And so you do have some people like that where they're just so gifted. They don't really have to know a lot about lifting to get really good results. But I would say that most people, yeah, you should be observant. You should keep learning. You should try to find people more advanced than you. And um, don't get too caught up in like over analysis, but realize that there's a difference between learning and analysis. Like you can keep learning without getting paralyzed as long as you put everything in context. Cool. All right. Next one is if you don't feel comfortable in your own skin as a man at 15%, cutting to 10% or below is not the answer. Yeah. So I, I, I see this with muscle growth as well, where someone thinks, oh, if only I gained a little bit better of a physique, then I would be happy. Where I see this on questionnaire stuff like, I want to build a physique that I can be proud of. And to me, that's just a little bit of a red flag where, I mean, at 15%, that's a very reasonable body fat percentage. I would say that's roughly where I am right now, maybe 16, 17, 18%. And yeah, if, if someone doesn't feel fulfilled or happy or, or content with that level of body fat, I would say it speaks less to the body fat and more to their mindset and more to just their satisfaction in life or satisfaction with who they are as a person there's something deeper there a little bit under the surface you see people who are just endlessly dieting or they are very attached to their abdominals or, or their shreds or how they look i actually think probably a lot of steroid users fall into this category as well where they're very attached to being the big guy the vascular guy mm -hmm. and so they kind of have to stay on them because they they hate themselves when they're off them. And I've had some very candid conversations with, with friends who are on them and like, they kind of hate how they look when they're not on them. And to me, that just seems like a very sad situation where there's something deeper under the surface. It, it's not the body fat. It's not the physique, the muscle, the steroids. It, it usually speaks to something where there's this deep discontent with who they are as a person. Yeah, I had a conversation recently with Eric Trexler around goal hierarchies. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's this top level identity and value based goal. And I feel like the people that fall into this situation, they haven't clearly defined who they want to be, what their value system is. So they're focused on these small goals, thinking they're going to do something for them. Yeah. And it's not going to give them fulfillment. And chasing happiness is also like the worst goal ever because... There's going to be times where you're not happy and that should be okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've never tried to be happy. I think, I think trying to be happy is almost like a, it's impossible because the more you try, it's like a dog chasing its tail. The more you get, the closer you get, the further it, 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 it sneaks away. Um, there was yeah. some celebrity who said someone, someone asked her, what is my goal? What is your goal in life? And they said, oh, my goal is to be happy. And the audience kind of like applauded. And they're like, you oh, did that's it. Done. Yay. <laughs> he said the answer. And I forgot how old I was, but my reaction was like, that's bullshit. <laughs> like, that's just a stupid answer. Like, 
why would your goal be to be happy? I mean, it's not even doing anything. It's just a state of mind. And so the audience love that, but I think that's, uh, it, it's an answer that sounds good, but is probably actually doing the audience harm because you can't get there by actively trying. All right, last one here, and I'm going to apologize in advance here. I want to run a marathon, look good in a thong, strong like the Parthenon, get a bigger python, bigger arms without arms. I want a six-pack and a nice rack, and I know my goals are whack, but I'm not lacking at tracking macros, but I'm prone to snacking on Fritos and nachos. Oh, man, that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's uh, that was a long time ago. That was a video from probably like 2020 or 2021. Um, and that was also kind of from coaching where you get these people where they have like 15 different goals. I want to get bigger and also stronger. Okay. Bigger and stronger for most people, those roads are headed in the same direction. Like you can get both bigger and stronger at the same time until you're extremely advanced, in which case, yeah, maybe there's a little bit of divergence in the roads. You kind of have to pick one. Uh, I know Eric Helms is sort of in that situation where the energy he has to put into powerlifting takes away from his bodybuilding so much that it's actually very hard to do both. Um, so he actually, he made the right choice and he picked bodybuilding, uh, which is, which is, you know, that was very, very good choice there. Um, so bigger and stronger, that's fine. Also leaner. Well, if someone is a little bit huskier, they can probably get leaner at the same time as getting bigger and stronger. Okay, I also want to run a marathon. Okay, whoa, that's, whoa, what, where's that coming from? Like, okay, uh, now we got a program for this. We got to add in some running. We got to have a long run, maybe some other tempo run. And so, oh, I also want to get more flexible. I want to have mobility. I also want to prevent injury. I also want to get my resting heart rate down. I also want to improve my blood work. And so you'll see people where they have a ton of, ton of goals. And I think it's good to have goals. But if you try to do too much, it can absolutely get in the way of getting to any of them. And so I would say it's not necessarily how many goals you have. It's how compatible those goals are. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone is a world record holding bench presser. And they say, oh, I want a bigger bench press. Okay, great. But I also want to run a marathon and a triathlon. It's like, okay, well, uh, you're already at this super high level. So you really need a ton of specificity and energy to go into just that. Even putting on five or 10 pounds onto your bench is a big thing. Whereas if someone has never bench pressed before, okay, like you're way down here. And so bumping those up is actually a lot easier. Um, and so... Yes, it's not necessarily about how many goals you have. It's, is this doable? And almost everyone wants to be leaner. That's one thing I've noticed uh, to the point where sometimes they'll say some things that make their goals just about impossible without realizing it. So maybe they'll be 200 pounds at maybe 20% body fat. And they say, oh, I want to be 220 pounds and 10% body fat. And I'm like, okay, so you want to gain 20 pounds while reducing 10% body fat. And then I'm like, yeah, this is probably, you know, you want to gain a ton of muscle while losing a ton of fat. And they don't really realize what they're asking because they didn't actually run the numbers. And so, yeah, I realized that muscle growth is slow. Fat loss is faster, but it's in the opposite direction. And yes, you can recomp, but that is the slowest way to go in most cases. And so it's just going to take longer. Most people also want it fast. That's the thing. They, they want the muscle fast. They want the results fast. And I think this is why most transformations that you see online are fat loss. Yeah, it's course. rare to see a muscle growth transformation because unless someone is a pure beginner, it's going to take a long, long time. It's going to take like a year or two or more in order to actually see the change. Whereas you can go from 22% body fat down to 12 in a couple of months if you really push it. 
and you get a great transformation picture. You can keep most of your muscle, especially if you manipulate the lighting and the angles and the flexing and, oh, they they look really sad before and really happy after. Slap that on a, on a website and you're going to get a whole bunch of normies, you know, slathering over that. But, you know, in reality, most people, they want muscle growth and it just takes longer. Yeah, the transformations are always fat loss because it's so quick and it's so noticeable. Yeah. Like I did one of those. I lost like 35 pounds in whatever, 100 days or 120 yeah. days. And everyone noticed and I was more vascular. I didn't have a ton of muscle, but people probably thought I was bigger then than now because I was at a leaner body fat and I had more veins going on like for gen pop, right? So it's more exciting than uh, for your muscle building transformation. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to get to the point where I have like a year transformation and it'll be like, I think I gained a pound of muscle. <laughs> and that's that's kind of just the reality of advanced natural lifting. At a certain point, yeah, things are are pretty slow. All right. So this is a good segue here. So you've mentioned that you are not near your genetic limit. And let's assume you have 15 pounds of muscle to gain over your lifetime. How would you allocate the 15 pounds if you can choose exactly? where it goes towards and be as specific as possible and, and explain why it, it would all go to my to one tricep long head just so i get some weird growth <laughs> hanging down um no I, I would probably i would probably allocate it mostly to upper body um just because if you if you allocate a little bit too much to stuff like adductors it just gets annoying like you start walking differently and you get chafing and it's just it's just not as fun so i'd probably like keep adductors about where they are maybe a little bit on the quads a little bit on the hamstrings um but i, I would say it would be mostly arms delts a lot on the lats I think that the look of, of like wide flaring lats and terries is really, really cool. Um, and so it, it would probably be mostly arms, back delts with a, a little bit on the chest. I don't like having like a massive chest where it's overpowering. Mm -hmm. um, so it would probably be more like delts, arms, back there. Yeah. Okay. I know that's the wish list because it's probably not going to be as easy to gain muscle in certain areas and others. But, you know, that, that kind of gives the vision of like, hey, what's that ideal physique, you know, to, to look towards. And I think the people listening can also understand like, okay, you know, a pound of muscle on your rear delt is not the same as a pound of muscle on your quads. So like sometimes yeah. we think so much in terms of numbers, but visually that that pound to the rear delt or side delta or triceps is going to make a much bigger difference visually. Oh yeah, for sure. And especially if you're lean and especially if you're observant, you film yourself a lot, you see yourself a lot, a pound or two of muscle in a year, that's, that's actually quite visible, especially as you say, I mean, if it's on like your side delts, rear delts, biceps, arms, forearms, I mean, if it's on your neck or somewhere, I mean, some areas, they just have a, a bigger muscle multiplier. Yeah. All right. I'm going to throw some images on the screen. So the first one here was from a uh, Quora article that you wrote back in the day. Um, it has Link from Zelda. Do you remember what this image was in regards to? I do not. All right. So you said breaking down muscle tissue makes as much sense as living in a log cabin and using the walls to feed your wood burning stove. And then you had this whole article on building cabins. <laughs> there you go. I mean, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, your your body won't use protein. I mean, it won't break down your muscles and use them as energy unless it like really, really needs to. I mean, that is the last place that it really wants to go. So it'll burn carbs, fats, glycogen, 
way before protein. Yeah. All right. I'm going to throw up a meme here. Tell me uh, what your first thoughts on it here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, I think you kind of have to go through that journey for anyone not looking. It's sort of a timeline of pure beginner, do whatever works best for you. And then it goes to most people who are in the middle where there's, there's sort of a sniveling crying nerd insert wall of text here. And then at the end, the uh, Sith master or the Jedi master just says, do whatever works best for you. And yeah, a lot of people go through that over analyzing period where they're, they're thinking a lot about training, they're reading a lot of studies, they're, they're really up in their own head. And I'm not entirely sure if that's necessary to go through. Uh, certainly, I went through it myself at times where I was really overthinking things when I really just needed to sort of get in there and, and work hard and focus on progression and um, eat enough food and sleep enough and manage stress. Cause, cause sometimes overthinking can be a source of stress. So ironically, it's actually getting you, getting you worse results. So I think it's sort of necessary to go through that. Not everyone does to the same extent. And I think if you go through it too much, then um, you might just get stuck there. Not everyone goes out the other end. You know, it's only a few percent who uh, are in that final phase. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is, but I, I think uh, there's definitely a grain of truth there. It's a it's an S tier uh, meme template for everything. I love this template. That's a great account too. I just assume even when my friends will say like, oh, you think you're on the Jedi side. I'm like, no, no, I'm on the super dumb side here, but I have the <laughs> right answer at least. <laughs> All right. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a whole lot of people on the screen. And because you are the tier list guy, I want you to tell me what is S tier about some of these people? You can pick a, a couple of them or you can do all of them, whatever you want. So tell me what makes them S tier, either from a content creation standpoint or educator standpoint. Okay, let's see. Uh, I think that's Eric Helms in the top left. It is. Okay. Oh man, he's, um, he's very reasonable. And I know that's, that doesn't sound like very high praise, but that is very high praise because there are a lot of people in the fitness industry who both on the science and the not science side who are not very reasonable where they just sort of, they get overly enthusiastic about a study or about a protocol or something. But, but he, he does have a great ability to keep everything in context and I think to really think about what is best for his audience. I, I think he has a lot of empathy and he, he, he really does care about doing no harm and, you know, following the Hippocratic oath, which I think uh, more fitness professionals should uh, definitely emulate. Alexander Bromley, he's really good for the nitty gritty of programming. He's more strength focused and more strongman focused. But in terms of progressions, in terms of like the technical details of how to progress, really, really, really good. Let's see, Bald Omni Man. Man, his videos are very just casual, just you know, very relaxing. Uh, he definitely knows his stuff, uh, but he's very, he's just very chill watching his videos, right? It's just like you're 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 chatting with a guy at the gym, and and you're you're both very into training and. It's just, you know, just like a good time. Trexler, let's see. S tier. He's super well read on, on the science, obviously. Um, and I, I followed his stuff for a very long time. I think probably his sense of humor, actually. <laughs> um, he, he has a great sense of humor. Uh, so that, that would be the S tier thing, I think. Uh, Milo Wolf. Um, I think a lot of my audience doesn't really like him. I, I get along with him really well. Um, I guess length and partials, you know, he's the go-to guy there. I think he's been pretty reasonable with, with his stance there. Um, 
other people have been a little bit more aggressive with with how they uh, promote them, but you know he's been actually pretty reasonable. Uh, who's that? James Smith. Um, one thing I don't like is how he kind of like vilifies bodybuilding. He kind of takes the stance of, oh, I'm talking to the general population, therefore I'm going to take a shit on on bodybuilding because they're the general population is a bigger audience and they're not willing to do oh yeah get a tan and go up on stage like i don't really like that but he's he's a great communicator he knows his audience and he you know that's one minor quibble but he knows his audience he's a great communicator and uh he's grinded for a while you know he's talked about how for many years he had a very small audience and then he blew up in the last few uh, and I think that's a pretty normal course of events where you suffer in silence for a long time and, and people just don't see that. Let's see. Uh, is that Huberman? Um, he's good for, so he's definitely been overtly enthusiastic about some studies and protocols numerous times before. Um, I would say that he's good at staying organized and giving just a whole bunch of information over the course of an hour or two hours or three hours. It's super impressive how he stays just focused that entire time. I watched a number of his, uh, his long form podcasts, both with himself and others. And it's very impressive to be able to put out that kind of information for that long. Bugenhagen, um, you know, caffeine in human form, basically <laughs> where, it's very enthusiastic, but I would say he's he's more knowledgeable than he lets on. He doesn't always go into the details of the science, but I think he knows more than a lot of people think. Uh, I think he actually has a degree in, I want to say kinesiology. I might be wrong about that. Um, but yeah, just enthusiastic, inspirational, uh, works hard. You know, so just an awesome source for that. Menno Henselman's, I actually took his PT course, which was very, very detailed. Expensive, but uh, overall, I think it was worth it. He's sort of followed down the Mike Isertel path a little bit, where mm -hmm. a little bit of algorithm chasing, where he's like reposting studies with small sample sizes and stuff, um, which he's gotten flack for. But overall, super well knowledgeable. I mean, he's he's genuinely an expert on muscle growth, especially the science-based side of things. So, yeah, definitely an excellent source if people are interested in that. Natural hypertrophy. He's the uh, he actually hasn't been as active lately. But if you want philosophy and natural bodybuilding, he's he's the go-to guy for that. And yeah, just an excellent source of of information overall. Um, and we haven't been seen in the same place at the same time. So, you know, there's conjecture oh. that we might actually be, be the same person. And then, uh, Steve Hall of revive stronger. I had a podcast with him recently. He's been making excellent progress and he, he gets like the best people on his podcast as well. Um, awesome. you're an up and comer. You've been getting some really good names as well, but he's been at this, like, Man, I probably saw his stuff back in eight, nine years ago at this point. So, yeah, he's uh, one of the goats for sure. And then Alberto Nunez, what I really like about his stuff is his voiceovers with his lifting technique. And he has a really good way of describing how he's lifting. A lot of people will kind of show you, oh, this is a bench press. This is how you move your arms but he will describe exactly how his body feels as he does it. And so you can look at him doing it, get in his head. He's describing how he's feeling when he's doing it. And so a lot of how he does dumbbell presses or how he does something in the Smith machine, I have found to be uh, very, very useful. And then uh, myself, I guess, uh, I don't know about S tier, maybe, maybe, maybe B tier or something. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how I would fit up there with those guys. Um, I don't know. Maybe I, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I think where your S tier is, uh, 
being educational in creative ways while having some humor associated with it. And I think you have kind of good um, analogies that kind of stick with people. Um, so I find your content to be kind of very entertaining and you're also willing to call out BS uh, when you see it as well, which I think is is good. And then I think even just going back to a lot earlier, we're talking about things like goodwill and doing the right thing. I think that's pretty apparent in your content as well. I think that's why you have a very loyal uh, audience. Well, thank you. Cool. Um, I'm going to do one last thing here because I think it might be funny here. So you did an <laughs> S tier, you did a tier list on what type of content is S tier. I didn't know this existed. This was pretty meta even for you. Yeah. So I want to throw out um, a couple of types of tier lists and you can tell me which one they fall under. Um, Reaction of tier lists. Is that superb, excellent, noob, or shit? Uh, let's see. Reaction of tier lists. Like a tier list of tier lists? Uh, no, just re reacting to a tier list. Okay, reacting to a tier list. I guess it would depend on how you do it. Um, I know Basement Bodybuilding has done them, and he adds enough substance and fundamentals and analysis and teaching and concepts and why that it would be superb s tier for sure um whereas other people if you don't add that much to it if you're like oh this is good or i disagree if you don't add that detail and if you're not as focused on the viewer i mean it could be it could be shit tier could be could be just drama yeah okay so it's more that it, the the tier list is a tool and regardless of what type of tier list, it could end up in any of these sections. Like someone could do a ranking YouTubers tier list and it could be a shit post or someone can do it and it could be S tier if it's done very well. It could be. Usually when people get involved, it tends to float more towards drama over concepts. Sometimes people will they'll use a name in a title or something in order to leverage that to talk about a concept. But I think usually it's just drama and then there's no real educational opportunity because usually people who are interested in that aren't as interested in education. So they don't stick around for that. If they, if they realize it's a bait and swap. Yeah. I think what's been interesting kind of being on YouTube is some of the content that I think is like, the highest quality from interviews where we're going really deep on intermediate and advanced concepts, they get like no views compared to the stuff that's more beginner focused. Yeah. But I also wouldn't want to go down that route because I don't think creating that beginner level content is overly useful. It feels very saturated. So I feel like that's actually a challenge as a YouTuber. It's like, you want to build the right content, but you also understand that sometimes you won't get a large audience for that. And you have to, and it's tricky because most of the big channels, they are big channels with a large number of subscribers because they had videos that got a large number of views and they got a large number of views because they were generally applicable or they were clickable, they were clickbait. And so they kind of get trapped in this, I have to make this kind of content mentality because anytime they switched, they saw their views tank because their audience of beginners or noobs or whatever didn't click on it. So you don't see drama channels change to enter to education channels, right? Because then they would just lose all their viewers. Um, and so once you're kind of painted into a box by the algorithm, yeah, it can be a little bit difficult to change. I mean, I've talked to people who put out really good content, but it has to always be almost the exact same thing because that's what their audience wants. And it, it, they almost get, get trapped in this, I'm doing well financially and the audience likes this, but I don't enjoy what I like doing. Or I, don't, I don't enjoy the content that I'm making. I'm just making it for my audience. And so 
I would say if you just follow what you like doing from the start, it's probably uh, a less painful way to go about it. Yeah, it's really interesting. Like when I think about the channel, um, I'm almost thinking of it like an album, like a music album. And I'm like, if at some point I feel like I can't release any more tracks, I'll just stop the channel. And maybe I'll create a new channel on a different topic. Because the last thing I'd want to do would be like chasing views or interviewing people that I don't think provide value because they have large audiences and they're going to provide more views. And I feel like it's easy to go down that rabbit hole, even just like messing around on YouTube studios. I've seen myself doing that. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, it's, it's, it can be addicting. You can tell the people, you can tell who is chasing the algorithm. They're changing their titles in the first hour that they release the video. They're changing the thumbnails. They're really hyper-focused on the first 20, 30, 40 seconds of the video to get retention. They use all these retention strategies. They do a lot of editing to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. I, I went through a phase where I was like doing a little bit more clickable stuff. But at the end of the day, you get a bigger audience. But I think it's better to just stay true to yourself and, and talk about the things that you want to talk about in a more organic way. Because, yeah, you get a bigger audience, but they all leave and stop watching your stuff anyway yeah. when it's just the stuff you want to talk about. So it's like maybe you have a bigger subscriber count. Like, OK, it would be cool to have a million subscribers. But if only 5% of those people are watching your videos now, like what's the point? You got a million people to click a button. Like who cares? It doesn't matter. All that really matters is who is currently watching your videos. And if you're suffering, putting out content for those people, talking about stuff that you don't really care about, to me, that doesn't really seem like the way to go. So I would say if you just stay true to yourself from the start, that's the way to go. And I know uh, Dave McConey, who I don't know if you know. Yeah, yeah I know um, Dave. Yeah. Okay, yeah. He, um, I think he said like, oh, I would make 50 videos about lifting and then just be done because there's nothing else to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like with clickbait, it's interesting because I kind of changed my approach on that. I almost view there's two types of clickbait. So there's the clickbait to get someone in the video. So that's like your thumbnail and your title. And I've opened up to being clickbaity on that because I'm a new channel and I feel like it's the only way to get people in. Um, unfortunately, it's like writing someone an email. Sometimes I will write like ex Googler and I'll write more things that people will read the email. But then once they're in the video, I would never want to change how the video is. It has to be pure substance. So then you want to yeah. under promise and over deliver. So I feel like when things get really clickbaity is when the content content isn't good or it's trashy or it's just to get clicks. But I have opened up on the like the thumbnail and the titling, unfortunately, because I'm like, I'm a small channel, people aren't watching my stuff. Hopefully they get in and see their substance and then stick around. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, I used to be very against clickbait, um, but it's something I've, you, you kind of have to have at least a little bit of it to a certain extent. There are a few channels who have done well. Like I know Sam Sulek has videos that are like chest day number 54 and like millions of views. But it's I think like that, that Ronnie, more... is that Ronnie Coleman edge case though, where it's like the yeah, exactly. personality and the genetic, just some people have it, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> he's, he, he's so likable. Um, you know, I, I get sent his stuff all the time and people are like, look at this steroid user. I'm like, yeah, but like, he's pretty Kinda chill. Like, like he's, he's a yeah. cool guy. Like, and so he, like he's a pop, I'm, gym. Like it's pretty chill or he's like at Planet Fitness just training. It's like, all right, cool. Yeah, he's not really, I mean, you can say, oh, he's promoting it, but he's not really even promoting it. And it's like, and then, you know, he can get away with, with because of the physique, because of, of just like the vibe and the personality, he can get away with chest day number 54 as the video title. But like, if someone is trying to get into the industry and they don't have that, which almost no one does. Yeah, it's like you have to have some way to get the click through rate up for sure. Yeah. And I feel like editing is an interesting thing too, because people are really leaning on like having perfect editing and really quick editing to kind of capture, I don't know if it's a younger audience, but it's a, it's a specific audience. 
but I feel like you don't have to do that necessarily where it's like, there's, you know, like old school video games. I didn't really care about the graphics if the actual yeah. game was good. And I feel yeah. like content can be in that direction as well. If you want to go the crazy editing way, you can go that way. But I don't think it'll ever be a requirement to do well with content. Yeah. And if I always took the perspective of if someone requires me to have a transition every two to three seconds to sate their visual appetite, well, they can fuck off because uh, they're not the kind of person I want to be around anyway. So it's like, okay, if you don't stick around past the intro because you needed that hyper stimulation, well, you're, this is not really going to be the channel for you anyway, right? Because we're more about the long term, we're more about delayed gratification. And so maybe those kinds of people will be ready for longer form content or more informational content or more just chill content where it's not PewDiePie slapping you in the face with a, a transition or a zoom in or a zoom out or something else every few seconds. You know, maybe they'll be ready for it in a decade or so. But if they're not at the moment, I'm not going to change myself to do that. Nice. All right. I'm going to uh, end today with kind of a, a fun question here. So um, I've seen you use Always Sunny in Philadelphia in your edits. Do you actually watch that show? I haven't in a while, um, but I watched it Who? for many years. Yeah. Who's your favorite character? I, I've watched every season of that show. Probably. That's a tough one. Probably Charlie. Um, just because he, <laughs> he's, uh, he's so well played and um, man, he just says the funniest stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, probably Charlie. D, Charlie. D is also pretty funny as well. I think D. The, well, she's uh, the part of all the jokes, right? Like, you know, so that's good. Well, I, I'm I'm yeah. Team Mac. Love Mac. Okay. And uh, that's a, when I when I got back in shape, then my some of my friends were calling me Fat Mac when I was overweight before. It was, it was great. Good times. Just yeah, cultivating mass. Yeah. Yeah, he's cultivating mass. He was he's just getting big. Yeah, yeah. It's that shows like I don't know, Family Guy, but it's not a cartoon, so it's like very. It's hard to watch at times, but it's also amazing. Oh yeah, it's it's. I mean, I I forget which season I got up to, um, but yeah, they've and they they started they started that show with like nothing, with like a thousand dollars budget or mm -hmm. something like. They have you know camcorders or whatever, and so you know it, it's proof that if you have a good idea and you have talent and you have humor, you don't need a big budget to uh, to do well. And that that kind of goes back to YouTube. If if you don't have all the editing and all the, the super fancy thumbnails and everything else, you know as long as your information is good and you're enthusiastic and you put hard work into the information and the details, you know, I think people respond to it. Awesome. GVS, thanks for your time, man. Where can everyone find you? Uh, Jeffrey Verdi Schofield on YouTube. And then uh, also the same, I think, on Instagram. All right, man. Nice chatting. Take care. Yep, you do.